Hello and welcome back to the Comic Literate Podcast, the podcast that does deep dives into the best of comic books, graphic novels, mangas, and penny dreadfuls. I'm your host, the soon-to-be-known-as-Comic-Stan, and with me, as always, is my productive co-host, it's Jamie. Been quite productive recently, haven't That's I? That's why I picked it, because I, I saw it on a list that I may or may not consult for unusual uh, descriptives, <laughs> and I so I thought, it's not that unusual, but it is more accurate. And I think you're yeah. going gonna to show that during the episode. Oh yeah, I, um, I got a bit into this one. Well, we're doing a little bit that required, I think, a bit more external discussion yeah. rather than uh, core text discussion if that's, that's what i'm here for yes exactly. research monkey and to be fair i did a little bit myself not on the stuff that you so you gave me a a brief synopsis of here's what i've looked at don't look at it because i've got this covered and i followed that i did a little something else which awesome. i'll which i'll bring to the table this uh, it feels like we're talking around something without talking about what it is Today we're talking about Barbie. Yes, and the main reason for it is not only because there's a Barbie film coming out, which may or may not look good. Like, we don't know. It's, well, it's a bit Lego movie-esque, it kind of looks like. Well, what's her name? Greta... Gert... 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 Win... Gert... Oh, we should know that. We, we, we probably should have prepared that. Um, hang on, fill, fill space. Um, yeah, so Greta Gerwig... Yes. ...is a good director... Um, she's been nominated for Academy Awards for both of her films that she's directed. Mm. One of which being Little Women. I've and, heard that's good. Yeah, and she's a real, really great advocate for women. And then Margot Robbie, uh, Margot Robbie's production company made this film. Mm. And so she's heavily invested in the project. And Margot Robbie is fucking brilliant in everything she's in. Like, did you, have you seen her as Tonya Harding? No, it's 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 been on my list for ages, but I haven't heard nothing but good things about her in that. Uh, Tonya's really good, mm. and she is particularly excellent in it. Mm. Again, in The Wolf of Wall Street, I think, although there is a an obvious... Gratuitous um, sex scenes and nudity? Yeah, I mean, she's obviously a highly attractive woman, and I think directors will sometimes make use of that in the way they tell their story. Mm. Um, but there's these brilliant little asides where her character is the one who explains to the audience the heavy financial stuff of what's happening. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, Margot Robbie's a sick actor. She's a really mm. fucking good actor. Despite, um, her ha ha. I don't, <laughs> she's not been bad in anything and she's not been in anything bad. She's been the best part of some bad films, yeah. which is the, if you're going to be in a bad film, that's like the best case scenario being in a bad film and people being like, well, they were the best part of it at the very least. And again, I think one of the key things that my research has taught me is that the Barbie debate is not as simple as I thought it was. Yeah, and the fact that even addressing what the debate is, I think is going to be a discussion in itself almost. Yeah, because there seem to be two quite distinct school of thought, schools of thought that both use the same talking points every time two people get together to debate this topic yeah um and so on the one side you have people saying barbie maintains unrealistic body expectations mm. and an unrealistic representation of a female body and then the other aspects the other people will say yes but um there was a barbie that was wearing a space suit encouraging little girls to go to space four years before Neil Armstrong did so. Mm. And we had Serge and Barbie in the 70s. And Barbie had a dream house. And I think the phrase that everyone keeps coming back to is Ken is Ken is an also sold accessory. Yeah, Ken is not central to Barbie's life. He is an accessory and he is there to serve Barbie. And so there's this one side that kind of really wants to focus in on the kind of unrealistic body type that's represented by a Barbie doll. And there's this other group who would argue that she's a feminist icon. Mm. And and like with a lot of these kind of discussions, the truth probably lies somewhere a bit in the middle. She's both. Yes. <laughs> and, she's a feminist icon that doesn't have a realistic body. Yeah. And if you're listening to this and thinking, hang on, I thought this was a comic book podcast. Well, you're still right, because we are technically looking at a Barbie comic book that was released in 1991. God, did you scrape the bottom of the barrel for <laughs> it as well? I mean, look, I'm all one for, like, technical, like, 
this technically meets the technically. criteria. The technical passes are the best kind of passes. Getting bar on a technicality. Yeah, yeah, technical wins especially. So this for me was like, if we can find a Barbie comic, <laughs> then we could do a main episode <laughs> and get that sweet SEO from the Barbie film. So what's the Barbie comic called? Um, hang on. One little note before we get to that as well is I just also want to be pr- like uh forward and open about the fact that i almost called this the oppenheimer tie-in pod episode and the reason being is i really loved the idea of like the the oppenheimer fans <laughs> seeing the episode going oh this looks good and then it finding out it was barbie that we were talking about barbie for an yeah. hour but so why didn't you the only reason i didn't is because <laughs> i did not want to miss out on getting the uh views from the actual barbie fans yeah absolutely so if there are barbie fans across all ages genders and what have you then we would rather have you here than a bunch of angry and christopher nolan fans yeah you guys seem much more cool yeah I, I i if i if i was at a party and you were sat on opposite sides of the room i know who i'd want to hang out with and it's the barbie people you seem pretty chill i mean the oppenheimer people i i are with the nolan crowd who would be talking about discussions like um well the dark knight is like real the highest point of cinema for the superhero genre and i'd oh. be like I, yeah, all right, but can we sound less wanky when we say that at all? Like, I mean, I I do enjoy. I not Dark Knight is one of my favorite films. I would say. Even, do, but, do you but, think is is it is it a big one for you? I yeah, I enjoyed it a lot, and but also, but I I see the criticism in the people who elevate it even further. Yeah, and I'm like, it's just a really for the time, it's a really good superhero film because it was the most realistic superhero film. Yeah, and that in itself, plus the non CGI yeah. action sequences, stuff like that, all those little things kind of came together. Heath Ledger's performance, obviously, goes yeah. without saying. All those things came to just making a really great superhero film that was a bit different to everything else at the time. It's weird though because I think the superhero guys really want to hold it up there as like one of the best pieces of cinema ever. And it's good. Like it's a, it was an enjoyable watch the first time I watched it, but it's not Citizen Kane. I mean, it depends what you're going for, because like we've had discussion in the episode where we talked about Terry Pratchett, mm. and we had a big discussion towards the end of that, which was deeper meaning metaphors and yeah, symbolism yeah, 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 versus yeah. good guy back. And I think Dark Knight is the reason it was critically and um, audience score. What was the term? Mainstream appeal, I guess. Yeah, I suppose. The reason I had both was because it did a bit of both. It it had the whole, you know, uh, die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a villain. It was it was quite on the nose, but it was also quite adapt to describing Batman, wasn't and it? And I think something that I have to get real about is that if we look at my list of like my top ten favorite films of all time, mm. the the first seven of them are arty as fuck, mm. and I just like arty cinema. Yeah. And so, mate, and that's the problem, isn't it? I find it again, it's one of those things that's like, oh, yes, but I'd rather be watching The Station Master. I'm like, fuck yeah. off, Jamie. And taste is taste. Like, you can't. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I get it. I get it. Interestingly, talking about superheroes, I didn't realize until we started reading these old Barbie comics that they were produced by Marvel comics. They were. And Marvel had to, like, I think even more so than DC, have a history of just being like, we are a comic book publisher. Give us your IP and we'll make a comic for you. Well, yeah, that's that's what they do, isn't it? That's what they're in the business of doing. But like, y- you don't, if you're a super fan, you don't, I think you don't realize how much, how many other comics they're making like this. Mm. And despite the fact that these comics literally have the Marvel logo in the top left corner. Yeah. But I think at this era, it wasn't as important to kind of differentiate like target audiences and stuff by like you wouldn't have little girls like in that in a what do you call it like the advertisers that kind of stuff yeah. like their their opinion of who their target audience is dictates what gets you know targeted and um yeah. sold towards advertised at who so these days i think there'd be a lot of like crossover of like oh, we can't put this logo because that will get yeah. like crossed over with this let's face it this comic book was not sold in comic book stores this was sold exclusively in amongst all the glossy magazines in supermarkets well you know what there. i what i thought this reminded me of was deep british reference this reminded me of being one of those one of like a thousand things in wh smith yeah where they just had a magazine or a comic and this really is closer to a magazine isn't it yeah i think the only reason it's kind of called a comic and i don't want to split hairs being like this isn't a real comic because or, it has a comic it's comic strip because it's and because it, it was made by a 
uh, yeah, because there's comic strips and and I was going to say published by a comic book publisher. Yeah. Um, it reminded me a little bit of, I used to read Simpsons comics. Yeah, me up. too. Weren't and they good? They were good. And I remember at the time, to me, the canon, without even knowing that word, the canon of the Simpsons comics was as important as the uh, the TV show, the cartoon. And then growing up, I watched, I rewatched uh, reruns of the Simpsons. So memorized those yeah, yeah, yeah. stories and jokes more. And I never went back to the comics. So it was only then right. further removed. I was like, oh no, the TV show was the main thing. The comics were a, a cash grab. Oh, you didn't realize which was... No, to me, it was all just like, this oh, there's, Simpsons. there's more Simpsons. I have to, I love Simpsons. I have to take in more Simpsons. I, yeah, when I was a little kid, like I remember the comics in the 90s. They were great, weren't they? Mm. Did you did you have the, because I, I, I remember people gifting me the big hardback annuals at Christmas that were just like yep. a bunch of them put together. Halloween ones. Yeah. Yeah, they were great. They were really good. Do you remember the book that they published, Bart Simpson's Guide to Life? Yeah, I had that. Yeah, Me too. And that was great as well, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I say they knew their audience. Oh, and, yeah. And I, I haven't thought about that in years. I don't know if that's like, if we can equate this Barbie comic to the Simpsons comic in the same way, because this feels like, I don't want to say lazy or less or less worked on less focused mm. on but it definitely had a different uh goal as a piece of work yeah didn't it just um yeah so should we start with some opinions straight up top what did you think of it because you read more of it than i did yeah you i tolerated I read, it for longer I read five issues <laughs> <laughs> i read the princely sum of one <laughs> yeah. i thought you got two didn't you i got halfway through the second issue right well, I, I had can, issues with issue one. Yeah, I can tell you what um, the two off the top of my head. I think there's two types of stories. No, say there's three types of stories that get repeated. There's about four stories a comic, like an issue, yeah. a larger one, and then three smaller ones. Yeah, and then there's like bits in between where it's like learn Barbie's dance move or whatever. Yeah. Um, the three types of stories were Barbie is about to do an event or a yeah. or a, a, some some activity or event or something, um, and someone who is the antagonist, a skeevy of the looking story, man, yeah, who for some reason has it out for Barbie, yeah, but has never quite <laughs> delved into the origins. <laughs> we're of never each told villain, why. Which I don't know if that's like a Joker esque inspired. Like maybe if we keep the origin secret, that'll make him seem more mysterious. <laughs> May, you know. Maybe, but they try and thwart Barbie. Yeah. And Barbie, without even realizing most of the time that someone was even trying to thwart her, yeah. just kind of through sheer uh, grace of and uh, strength of character and yeah. just uh, having a, a good old attitude, just kind of perseveres and then it succeeds even further because of said yeah. um, actions against her. So yeah. the roadblocks, what have you. So that's the first type. Second type is Barbie's doing something with her friends or sister Skipper, who I re revolutionary new character for me. I didn't know, <laughs> she had, but maybe with Ken or something. Yeah. And this time it's the it's a story about the interactions, normally some kind of either misconception or something where Barbie kind of shows her value as such a good friend. Yeah. Where she basically helps her friends with this issue or misconception that's happened yeah. and it's like god gee isn't it great to have barbie such a good friend to help us out you know? yeah 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 uh, aren't we lucky familiar. to be friends with barbie that kind of thing and then the third one was barbie inadvertently uh does something educational for the readers yeah absolutely so it's, it's like helping a baby bird back to the nest but yeah. like you know they have to like be careful see if they really need help always get an adult i i enjoyed that yeah. theme of the before you do anything that we're telling you, get, <laughs> get, an, a, get an adult. <laughs> we are not liable if you do if you do something without an adult. Yeah. Um, that or it was getting lost in the woods and then using the North Star to to find your way home. That's and showing exactly how to locate the North Star. So those were your three so um, there was what, archetype stories. And and there, all three of them were in the first issue, weren't they? There was one of each. Oh, for sure. Yes. And my favorite was the Barbie fixes things using education see my like, favorite was the one with the antagonist because that of felt course to me, it like, was, I was of course examining it was. the villain like who is this and how do they know <laughs> and i had a lot of notes on that first story no but, shit did you oh, yeah of course i mean to, let's we'll proper get into the comic now yeah because i don't think we've got uh, much to get through but just for our own amusement at the very least and then we'll 
talk about wider wider subjects. Yeah, I just want to chat. I mean, ultimately, this was an opportunity. I, I saw this as an opportunity to have a chat about Barbie. Yeah, of course. Um, and I had to do some Barbie research around Christmas last year. Mm. I go into it, but I had to. Um, and I found Barbie to be post-2016. That's when they introduced more body types and races and they um, uh, interabled Barbies into the line. Mm. I actually found shopping for Barbie to be really quite fun. Yeah. Um, because there's so much diversity in what Mattel will sell you as a Barbie doll now that you can, you know, if you're buying Barbie, buying a Barbie for a child, um, you can buy them a Barbie that represents them, roughly. Mm. Um, you know, most human beings of most shapes, sizes, colors, races, you can buy a Barbie for them. And that's actually pretty dope. And I thought it was really cool. And it was, I was expecting it to be really stressful and for me not to find what I was looking for. And I went to a fucking Smith's and there was a billion Barbies and I found the one I wanted. Mm. Um, so I will say, actually, kind of on a capitalist level, hats off to Mattel. They've done a good job. Mm. Like in, in, in the past, what, seven years since 2016 when they updated the line, they've done all right. Mm. Like you can, you've got a kid who wants a Barbie. You can find them a Barbie that kind of looks like them and represents them. And that's really cool. Mm. And we'll get into the wider ripples of society and everything like that as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope the readers appreciate the effort we've put into this episode particularly, mainly because I think our searches might have put us on lists. And I don't mean lists like <laughs> bad lists, but lists just like, let's just keep an eye on these guys. Like uh, Their searches <laughs> were not, not quite usual for, uh, for their demographics. So, so appreciate the effort that's gone into uh, this deep dive. So I... <laughs> Do you want to touch on the comic first? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I, I found the comic to be highly uninspiring. I'll be honest with yeah. you. It was definitely pitched at much younger children. A hundred percent. The key things that I found interesting about it aren't actually about the comic. So I'll probably, if, if you have any thoughts on it, I mean, it left. It, I'll be, I'll be frank with you. It left minimal, a minimal impression on me. Yeah. And I went straight back to the other stuff that I was reading about Barbie that I found infinitely more interesting. Yeah, of course. Um, I made notes as I would normally read a comic, yeah. and then it was after a couple of different stories. I was like, oh, these my notes don't matter. Like, well, my observations I'm don't matter. I'm glad that you went through that process, and I'm glad that you read more issues than I did, because I wouldn't have noticed that pattern, because I only read one and a half issues. Well, we we normally will make these points and discuss them as as we go through them. But again, the problem was there's there's... Almost zero continuity, at least in the five issues. Like <laughs> maybe a bigger Barbie verse kind of spreads, the like Barbie starts, verse. you know, between stories. I'm it, a Barbie verse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> X amount of time till we till that song got mentioned. Um, <laughs> there's yeah, there's no continuity in them. So the normal kind of notes, like I 100% agree with you that the interesting stuff is not in the context of the story, but the the larger implications of the story and mm. the, the audience connection and reaction and everything like that. But as I said, I've got some notes that I think genuinely yeah. we could, this might be, this might be like a one day, like charity live stream idea. Yeah. It's just us literally reading the comics live <laughs> and, and basically like these kind of notes that I've made, but in live reading time. Yeah. So in the first story, the bad guy's named is, C meant so C dot meant because he's from he, a cement age a cement company yeah so w did he start the company because his name was that or did he change his name because he was in a cement company like what was the thinking there I'm not quite sure um I don't know what like was it meant to be a pun but then it doesn't quite work as a pun although so one thing I also noticed so we're not mentioning artists or writers yeah and that's because they I think pr I'm almost certain they changed per story. And I don't, not even per issue, but per stories within the issues. Yeah. Um, but some of the issues and some of the writing styles, my, I'll tell you what, my favorite issues, and I don't know who, who did what, my favorite stories within issues were the very pun heavy yeah. stories. And I don't know if you, if you got to them or not, but there are some issues where there is a, I would say, a well-crafted pun per panel yeah some, no some and they were and, and they were yeah I, I agree i mean even in the first issue when they were doing the fashion show mm. that c men prime example yeah mr men's like goon was trying to thwart i loved his goon because he had such a uh 
yeah, you get them, boss, kind yeah, of energy. Absolutely. Well, he reminded me of a Scooby-Doo villain. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's with him, that's largely what they were going for, wasn't it? They were, mm. I mean, didn't it feel like a Saturday morning cartoon from the 80s? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm surprised. I assume this probably was in some form or another. At in, some point, yeah. The, the, a cartoon was probably made in the exact same way. Yeah. Like, the difference was obviously the medium. Uh, the stooge to the bad guy looked like Mario for some reason. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if that was intentional or not. And that was just after an um, ad for Mario shampoo well, in the comic. This is the one thing that I wanted to get into. So we'll talk about it now because you've mentioned it. Sure. Yeah. The most interesting thing for me in the whole comic was the adverts. Because this, this comic, the issue one, was just fucking laden with brilliant 90s nintendo adverts oh yeah they they all, are especially nostalgic for us but they but it was all nintendo like i don't know if tendo, nintendo just had the exclusive rights to advertising this issue or if it was the whole way through the run but there were there yeah there was the advert for mario soap mm. and then there was an advert for a game boy game yeah. And then there was another advert, I think, for something NES or SNES related. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, this might require additional research. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Marvel were doing Nintendo comics or there was some other partnership at the time. But do you know about the Pink Isle and the Blue Isle? The, uh, toys, uh, the toys for children. Gender toys. I so, looked into this as well. So obviously we had a similar thinking. Well, I've all, uh, it's, been in, it's been on my radar for a long time. Yeah. Um, I learned about it years ago, but essentially in the, uh, in the early, in the mid to late 1980s, um, toy shops started marketing certain toys towards boys, certain toys towards girls, and they had a pink and a blue aisle in their toy shops. Do you know what inspired that change in marketing? Um, I did so, know this. Yeah. So, uh, before that they were just advertised as family home entertainment systems. So it wasn't gendered. It was literally family. Are we get- talking specific to video games? Yeah. Sorry. Video games. Well, they had to pick one because they could only be in one place yeah. in the store and they picked the blue aisle. Well, the reason they had to pick an aisle. So beforehand I said it wasn't gendered. It was family. Because they wanted to market them as toys. It was because of specifically video game crash. So they had a video game uh, crash e. when E.T. Yeah, e. yeah. was like the, the spearhead, yeah. but there was a lot of shit games to be made at that time. Well, for so, the Atari, there certainly Exactly. Was, yeah. So Nintendo did, they launched this campaign of like the Nintendo guarantee. So yeah. it said if a game had Nintendo on it, it's good. And it's but, not yeah, those pieces I of shit. I do know about this. And yeah. well, this is what I, this, because I, I hadn't even gotten into where the link was, but I think you've clocked where I'm going with this, is that, yeah, Nintendo had to pick, Nintendo wanted to market the NES as being a toy, not and electronic and so they had to pick a pink aisle or a blue aisle for it to go in they picked the blue aisle mm. so we've got a pink aisle comic right which exclusively has adverts for a blue aisle product in it yeah so this this comic is you know and again we're using the parlance of the 1990s i don't think this way but this is how the marketers would have thought at the time yeah they've got a i'm using air quotes so aggressively now girls comic yeah with adverts for something that would have been in the blue aisle in it. Mm. And it just baffles me as to how that decision was made, how that was allowed to slip through the net. Like, you'd think there'd be adverts for fucking Barbie dolls in there, wouldn't you? Mm. Like, wouldn't that make sense? I'm reading a comic about Barbie. Mum, Barbie, I need a Barbie doll. <laughs> like, I think that I assume the thinking is that any, any bits of writing magazines, anything that a child is reading is probably being you would assume, checked by a parent first. So while there's... And I think under that... This is that, the 90s, mate. Well, yeah, but I You'd think... you let your kids play in a fucking disused quarry back then. Well, there's also... Oh, oh 100%. But there's, there's also a thing that I've, I've noticed as a kid where children's television channels would have your ads for toys, yeah. but it also have ads for like life insurance and stuff like that. Because the parents are watching as well. Exactly. Yeah. And I just assume there's something similar with comics, set children's comics, where the parents gone either had a flick through, make sure it's appropriate, or at the very yeah. least, a, like a, the kid's reading and the parent goes, hey, what, 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 what's happening in your comic? And they go, oh yeah, this, this, this. And they go, ooh, that's a toy idea for the, for the boy or something. Yeah, yeah makes That's sense, the possibly. thinking, I assume, of the... Um, the PR advertisement people at the time. Some pretty high level thought for nineties advertisers. I mean, like, advertisers have always been to the pinnacle of like, how can we get as much money from people as possible? Yeah, but, yeah. In fairness, we've we've both seen Mad Men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, it it was definitely interesting. I didn't notice the special the specific gendering of the different gendering of the ads. 
um i suppose i didn't think of it because i just assumed all ads toy ads in general were you know typical of being in like children's ads were just grouped as children's ads yeah but i know what you mean about like the aisles were the the pink aisle and the blue aisle yeah you're you're advertising a blue aisle toy in a comic that's aimed at pink aisle yeah and audience. interestingly enough the the reason that the video games fell into the boys blue aisle i mean i well, think they people, just had to pick one didn't they well that and their their reasoning at least their presented reasoning was that the time apparently because there were more boys going into stem field jobs and work uh, they just assumed, well, games are technology, so boys are more into technology. Yeah. Which is, unfortunately, as we now know, looking back, was it was because women never actually felt accepted to actually pursue those kind of um, Have you seen any of, of the research on the what people think are the wider implications of video games having ended up in the Blue Isle? Um, well, they definitely um, alienated a lot of potential women from getting into video games because 100%. they were so geared towards the male gaze but it also influenced the type of video games that were made and the way that they're advertised mm. they they people sincerely think that the only reason that shooty bang face is such a prevalent trope in video games and i say shooty bang face i mean first person shooters yeah. why they are so disproportionately popular amongst developers is because they were developing for boys Mm, yeah. And actually, if that had never happened, we would have a much more well-rounded video game industry with more than just shooters. Yeah, no. Um, and, and we do have that. I know we do. But it is, I mean, in, in terms of AAA games, there's a lot of shooty bang face. I think it's definitely a theory and I'm not disputing or anything. The only, the only devil's ad- advocate other side, I think, is there is an element of like games, especially when they were simpler technologies, having to be a simple action. So like yeah. point and shoot was, was very, one of those ones. Yeah. But then you also, on the other side, there are games that grew to uh, be successful, like games like point and click or things like that, which yeah. were non like overtly masculine setting. So um try to think of best examples, but like like I suppose like Zelda games were never like adventure yeah. was not really like masculine or feminine really. It was pretty universal. So they were, those games were definitely getting through the cracks, but I see what you mean about would the prominent ones yeah. be I the mean same. that's Nintendo though, isn't it? Well yeah, and but interestingly Nintendo, as I said, that they were the first ones putting their games in the blue or red. Well, it was their fault that it happened. Yeah. Like, Atari was... had just failed, Nintendo had just taken the reins of being the market leader, and it was gonna be a few years before Sony come caught up with the playstation one so well seven or eight yeah no exactly so there was a while where nintendo has were shaping how we view games now yeah absolutely and it's all because of barbie somehow <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a tangent but it's it's within the same thing it's <laughs> i said the going back to the comic for just to make sure we exhaust it before we move on yeah i think the most interesting thing about it for me was again like the, showing barbie as I believe an aspirational or at least intended to be an aspirational character. Yeah. And what And th- that is the whole and that is the whole argument uh that people who are pro Barbie give. Mm. And again, um I imagine that Mattel wouldn't have let anything through that did anything to undermine that, particularly yeah. in the nineties. Anything negative at all, negative portrayal of Yeah. And that actually takes me into the little bit of research I did, yeah, which go I for it think is maybe one you you haven't touched on if you were looking kind of directly at the barbie mm. franchise um one thing i felt while reading the comic is you, you know you we could tell what comic it was is heavy exposition expositional laden dialogue yeah. and simple problems simple solutions and ah oh, shucks aren't we lucky that barbie's our friend kind of thing one thing i read it was looking at it or trying to look at it through the eye of you know fiction yeah and judging it by that standard which i think is <laughs> i think is a harsh measure for something it's that's very obviously a thinly kids, veiled yeah. marketing isn't it it's a kids marketing thing desi- d- disguised as you know entertainment shall we yeah. say but then things like that can be good like the most famous one i think of is the transformers film the biggest most expensive advert for toys at the time ever and a lot of transformers fans hail it as a good telling and a good story of the transformers genre or yeah, maybe. franchise so whether you can hold it up to standards or not is another debate but one thing while reading i thought was is this something what it made me think of is the trope of the mary sue now mary sue 
I'm not uh, familiar with it, so go for it. So the trope of the Mary Sue is, it's one that began originally in, I believe, the 70s, mm -hmm. and has actually kind of been co-opted in more recent times. So the modern thing, and the one that listeners might more uh, recognize it from, it's a criticism of characters who basically are too naturally perfect. Right, okay. So the idea that a character can enter a story and just be either beloved by everyone just immediately or great at everything immediately and also um, just adapts very well to the situation with very little resistance and basically not as much story development or character yeah. development or anything like that. It's one that kind of gets thrown around a lot with varying degrees of like general agreement some people say, you know... Um, so who's Mary Sue? So a modern example that most people seem to be agreed on uh, is apparently, I think it's Bella from Twilight Films. <laughs> so <laughs> That makes sense. Apparently, and I, I say this as someone who hasn't <laughs> seen the Twilight Films, not out of any kind of intentional refusal. I just haven't got around. They just didn't appeal. Yeah. But apparently she is just essentially beloved by, if not most, all characters uh, from the start. She, especially Edward, for not yeah. many reasons other than he's just in love with her. She becomes a... Spoilers for Twilight, if that matters at all. Um, she becomes a vampire and then immediately becomes great at being a vampire, which apparently was unusual in itself as well. Yeah. And uh, just basically six, keeps succeeding without much resistance. Yeah. The biggest issue, I think, in the Twilight series is like she she gets pregnant and she's worried the baby's gonna kill her. So she just becomes a vampire yeah. and then everything's fine. Like yeah. it's that's the bit the the most obvious one that I saw in my research. So the reason I did have a look, because one thing I wanted to check was is this concept by being called Mary Sue maybe an inherently sexist one? Is a bit. So I looked up the original um basically the origins of the term. Yeah. So where it came from, uh, incidentally, was actually in the 70s, it was fan fiction of Star Trek, where this first came about. So I was surprised to learn, not that there was a big fan fiction like community during when Star <laughs> Trek was on, more that it was thriving so much without modern technology, but apparently yeah. they were submitted into fan magazines and then published to everyone. But that Star way. Trek was one of the first um franchises that had a very big fan fiction community exactly yes and what was also surprising to me and i just never considered there could be anything different was that most of the fan fiction was written by women now oh. i don't know it maybe like like me you might have had a stereotypical idea of the average trekkie fan especially yeah. in the 70s and also the kind even a further layer a deep layer the kind that would sit and write fan fiction and then submit it in yeah but apparently mostly women which I, I mean i didn't know there's a lot of women who write fan fiction like because my, my interaction with fan fiction was like tumblr and my overwhelming sense was that it was often women writing it mm. i don't know how true that is but that, that was certainly my experience so the I reason i've read a whole lot of fan fiction <laughs> So I, I haven't, but the, apparently the reason this Mary Sue trope came up was there was a specific person who I will name just for the sake of getting a little more information to the listeners, but it was someone who was kind of big in the um, fan fiction uh, area, uh, specifically with Star Trek. Uh, it was someone named Paula Smith. So she was a I think like an editor or publisher of one of those magazines. Yeah. And she noticed a trope that kept of repeating. Of the Mary Sue. Of the Mary Sue. But specifically what it was, was because it was apparently these women writing fan fiction. They were basically putting themselves. self insert characters, yeah. In the character, in the story. But all their favorite characters in Star Trek loved them immediately. Yeah, of they had an immediate connection with one of the characters. So it was yeah. either like a long lost sibling or a someone from their past or yeah. a clone, a, a alter gendered clone or something. They yeah, had some connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loved by everyone on the ship. <laughs> uh, immediately v incredibly capable of whatever needed to be done in that episode. And then also, and this is the odd part of like repeating across different fan fiction writers. They always had a heroic sacrificial death at the end as well. So it was Sounds. kind of like a, it was not only a, this is why they're not in later episodes, <laughs> but there was apparently Paula Smith identified. It was a kind of um, too 
cure for this sinful world kind of oh, trope. Delightful. Like they were so good that they couldn't actually stay in this shitty reality Love that it. is this fan fiction. Live for it. So the reason it was called the Mary Sue was Paula Smith wrote a parody of that, but, su- <laughs> but submitted it as if it was real. She wrote a fanfic of fan, fan fiction. And hers was was um protagonist was Lieutenant Mary Sue. Right, okay, cool. For, for exactly that reason. I so like that. So that was where the trope originally identified. It's kind of been co-opted now into just a character being just very proficient, yeah. but, but with little like um little reason to. Uh and this it, is Barbie in these comics, isn't it? Exactly. Uh more commonly debate is Ray from the latest Star Wars. <laughs> I did wonder when you were gonna mention that. Yeah. Because I've just been I've just been in my head thinking about a few of them. Did you find this on TV Tropes, by the way? Uh I think I searched it and came that was one of the responses, yes. TV Tropes is a website I used a lot. Me and my mates would sit on it a lot when I was doing my English degree and we would just fire tropes at each other um tv tropes is really good if mm. you've if you are a comic book fan who likes this quite because comic book is quite tropey yes um if you like quite tropey comic books definitely have a look at tvtropes.com yeah and i think that the concept of mary sue is really interesting in it in of itself um yeah i i like one of the debates is whether captain america in the mcu films is, <laughs> it, is it mary sue no because, because he had that struggle at the start so it, what's interesting is he in his kind of resolve and his his character is, yeah is kind of, it's it meets a lot of the criteria of mary sue because he just kind of achieves everything he needs to yeah but, but then the the struggle be, be becomes him becomes in remaining this way in spite of the world around him can i just raise something ryan sure um you did a bit of wider research for this episode not a bit about Barbie. We're currently talking about Captain okay. America. <laughs> so, <laughs> how are we talking about superheroes in a non-superhero episode? I, I mean, will not a, have it. He's a Marvel character, and this is technically a Marvel comic. So, Mate, this is this is my backdoor into superhero discussion. Fuck off! But do you so, know what this does mean? Mm. Barbie is a superhero. Well, could definitely be in the MCU. I mean, Margot Robbie, she could literally, it could be Nick Fury at the end of the Barbie film being like, I'd like to speak to you about the Avengers initiative. Oh, wouldn't it be so good? I think it'd be hilarious. Like, and then all the nerds will get angry and then they'll Google Barbie comic book and they'll come to this podcast. (laughs) The nerds, I mean, that's great. The nerds will be angry because they'll hear about it online and then have to go and pay to see the Barbie film in the cinema because they have to see the post-credits scene. Yeah, exactly. It's an MCU film now. It counts, it counts. Um, so <laughs> the discussion I thought would be interesting about Barbie and this Mary Sue trope is yes. whether this counts or not. Because on the one hand, I think it meets the criteria on a on a base level tick box, you know, yes. way. But on the other hand, I think, what is the point of this comic? Like, is it <laughs> is there a, is well, there I think struggles for the character to overcome or not? And I don't think there is enough to say this is a, a this is not even a genre a Mary Sue could be identified in well i think i think it brings into question whether or not it's fiction i mean i mean by the truest sense of the word i i would say it is is it fiction or is it advertising i mean is advertisement fiction well and this is the question i'm asking you is is i don't know that i would call this comic book fiction i i i genuinely i sincerely think it is an advert for barbie and the barbie universe it depends Without going back and forth, like I think we we could on this. I think the, yeah. the main point is what? How do you define fiction? Absolutely. And if you define fiction by the strictest dictionary definition as a invented story, yeah, of whatever medium, then yeah, there's advertisement that is fiction, yeah. but it's but it's fiction for a very specific purpose. Whereas I think you're going down the route of, and correct me if I'm wrong, fiction for the for the explicit. Um, point of entertainment and deeper storytelling well i don't know this is the thing i um i've never i've never really thought about what i would consider fiction and what i wouldn't um there is an element of storytelling here and i think on some level you could argue that some of these stories adhere to the hero's journey yep yeah um there is a call to adventure and Barbie has to overcome something. I mean, she never refuses the call. No. She's just, you know, yeah, she's always up for it. Yeah, no, we fall down at the first point because she does not refuse the call to adventure. Um, Although there was a one story where... Oh, fuck, have we found one? <laughs> well, it's it's an interesting one. It's I, for using that term relative, <laughs> relative within Very this episode. Loosely. Yes. 
um, her and Ken accidentally end up in a sailboat race because their <laughs> sailboat gets lost. <laughs> And not only do they accidentally win of the course, sailboat of race, they do, because she's a Mary Sue, but then the character, the, sorry, the the people who were the real technical first place, yeah, then arrive, and Barbie goes, "We weren't part of the race because you know we didn't officially compete or anything. They won the race, so they deserve the prize and the gold. That's and everything. noble." And then someone goes, "Oh, by the way, even if you didn't officially participate in the race." You have still technically broken the world record, so <laughs> you get a prize anyway for winning for so the world good. record. And Barbie's like, "Well, I guess I can't turn that down, so uh, I guess I'll have to accept so this prize." Um, What's so- Ken like? Because I didn't, I didn't read, I didn't read enough to see Ken. Ken, I would describe in the best co way as the, and I think they've captured this in the film. He's the archetypal uh, himbo. The yeah, yeah, well-meaning, yeah, yeah. not too bright, but still well-intentioned um, boy toy, for basically. Yeah, and, and, and again, I think that's one of the things that people really love about the Barbie universe, is that they introduced a male character and didn't make him the focus. Like, I'll tell you one thing that this comic book absolutely does, Ryan. Mm. Passes the Bechdel test. I mean, 100%, yeah. Some, some issues, Ken's not in it, or any men. Well, no, there are two women having a conversation and none of those conversations are about men. Yeah, yeah. It, do you know what? I didn't consider it until right now. <laughs> but that first issue, I, it passes the fucking Bechdel test, Ryan. Yeah, I'd say most probably issues, most stories, at least maybe just over half, which and is you know fantastic what? for a thing from the 90s. Fucking A, we are talking about something that was given to little girls in the 90s mm. that passes the Bechdel test. I can't be mad at it, can you? I suspect, and I we would have to do much more in-depth research to verify this. Yeah. I suspect that there were complaints or issues raised in good faith before this era. So maybe like late 80s, when it was popular for parents to look at what their kids were consuming and yeah. say, what's the issues with these? So most famously, late 80s was the satan is in the uh, heavy metal <laughs> music and everything like and that D&D. yeah and also vi- you know violent video games yeah, and, yeah or yeah. not even video games back then but like violent music violent games cartoons whatever comic yeah. books especially had yeah. been through the comics code of authority in the 70s so i think i suspect that the makers of barbie the people who are at the top yeah i think they had a across the entire franchise awareness of barbie needs to be positively considered by society in general like the the ideal person by most people's standards and one of the things that came up in my research is i did look at a bit of an evolution of barbie as the dolls evolved um and i think one of the criticisms is that although mattel always tried to put barbie at the front of women's issues they were often really reactive Mm. and barbie wasn't necessarily driving anything forward for young women um but they were but they were reacting to what the tide of the time was and allowing barbie to continually change and evolve to fit in with that Mm. and that's positive to a certain degree and i think mattel did a really good job of that Mm. um the something that i researched a lot is where barbie actually comes from right and I think you'll be thrilled because it brings us all the way back around 360, hmm. baby. I'm I'm on the edge of my seat. Do you want to know where Barbie, the very first germ of the idea that became Barbie started? Uh, something German, I'm going to guess. You know this. Have I mentioned I it? I said blonde hair and the Barbie song is, is that German? Um, so I don't know if Barbie name is German or something. It was literally, that's like a complete shot in the dark. It's a really good, it's a very impressive guess. Right. Um. Started in a comic book strip in a German newspaper. Wow. See, I did think just like completely almost unrelated was that I had never heard the name Barbie in any other context. Well, that's not German. <laughs> right. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> so that comes from a completely different place. So would you like, would you like a brief history lesson with Jamie? Yes. I mean, that's, that's why we're here. So on the 24th of June, 1952... Uh, the first issue of the Biddle newspaper came out mm. and they needed something to fill a space on page two. And so they reached out to a bloke called, and I'm going to butcher his name, Reinhard Buthin, right. um, to create a comic strip. 
and he created a comic strip called Lily. Now, Lily was an incredibly beautiful, very, very hypersexualized secretary. Mm -hmm. And her comic books were kind of really like laden with puns and innuendos. Like a carry on kind of style. Yeah, similar, although she was a working woman and she was often very much at the front of her own story and she knew exactly what she wanted and the comic strips were very funny by the standards of the day. Right. Um, And so the Biddle Lily comics went on for a while. I've gotten a selection of jokes from them, if you'd like. Uh, I'm all I'm all ears. So there's one punchline where she says, I could easily live without an old bald man in my life, but my va- but my vacation fund couldn't. Right. And then there's one where she is at a beach. So yeah, apparently in the 1950s, two-piece bathing suits weren't legal in Germany. Right, yeah. Doesn't sound like a great time to be alive, but there we go. Mm. Um, so a policeman walks up to her and says, two, two, two-piece bathing suits are prohibited. And she says, no problem. Which of the two should I remove? Right. So um, <laughs> this, this kind of feels almost like the origin of the, the archetypal blonde jokes. Yeah, kind of, well... Yeah, although I can ima- I can't imagine that blonde jokes really come from Germany because everyone's Everyone fucking blonde. blonde. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did um, you hear about the blonde? It's like, yes, whoever you're about to talk about, yes, I did. <laughs> but the Lily comics were incredibly popular. Right. So much so that in 1957 there was a feature film. Uh I've only got the English translation of the title, A uh, Girl from the Big City, mm-hmm. and it was a really popular um feature film. It was from around the time that like Bridget Bardot would would have been really popular. Right. And so again, like these very sexy women in cinema in Europe and England. And so it kind of fitted into what was going on there. Um, but in 1955, they released a doll, the hmm. Biddle Lily doll. Um, and it was a plastic doll of about the height of an action figure. And it did really, really well. Um, it was quite expensive. It was seven with seven seven and a half retin marks right or deutsch marks whatever they were spending at that point in germany i think they were still spending the retin mark weren't they um so it was relatively expensive mm, i mean um, just to make a, a mold of plastic back then was like to have a thing made of plastic that wasn't essential was like absolutely like high luxury. yeah absolutely and so yeah so in 1955 in 1952 uh lily appears for the first time in the comic book strip Lily comics become a regular thing, still written by Reinhardt. Mm. Um, he wrote her for pretty much her entire life in the com- in the in the newspaper. I'm gonna go out on a limb, and I'm gonna assume whether you've seen this or not. I'm gonna assume that the merchandise profits started to outgrow any and all other versions of profits to do with this character. Oh, undoubtedly, yeah. yeah. Lily, Lily was probably other than the newspaper itself the most profitable profitable thing that Biddle had. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, the movie was licensed, the toy, the doll was licensed. And so, yeah, Lily was just this kind of cultural phenomenon in Germany in the 1950s. So cut to 1959 and mm-hmm. a woman called Ruth Handler, yep. whose husband was Elliot Handler, who was a senior of some description at Mattel, noticed her daughter playing with her baby dolls and giving them jobs and grown up things to do. And obviously, baby doll- dolls in general, up until the 1950s, had always just been baby dolls. And they were given to young women as a way to encourage them to be mothers and homemakers. Mm. That was what it was. And if you were poor, you just had some kind of like leftover potato sack that you pretended was a baby or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but she noticed her daughter playing with dolls in a different way. She was giving them adult jobs. And so she went to her husband and Mattel and said, what if we made a doll that had adult proportions? And they laughed at her. I was, I was literally about to say it's a joke. I was about to say, and then a man went, actually, I've just had an even better idea, and then said the same idea and got applauded. Absolutely. Yeah, that's literally yeah. what happened. No, they poo pooed it and they didn't want it. Right. And then she went to Switzerland and she found Biddle Lily. Right. And she bought three of them mm. one for her daughter and two to take back to Mattel. And she took them back to Mattel and she showed it to them and said, look, the idea I had is working really well in Germany. We should make this. Mm. They did. <laughs> right. And so in 1959, we see the first Barbie doll hit the shelves. So they changed the name from Lily to Barbie? Yeah, sorry. Ruth's daughter was called Barbie, Bar- Barbara. Ah, That's where Barbie we... comes right, from. Right, right, right. Ruth's daughter was Barbie, Barbara. Guess what her son was called? Was it Ken? Fucking Kenneth. <laughs> she named Barbie and Ken after her children. In the context of things, that's a little bit weird. 
Yeah. <laughs> I suppose in her mind, it was kind of like, and here's going to be the male equivalent for my son as opposed to my daughter. And then yeah. they were like, what if they were, you know. What if they fucked? What if they were fucking though? And she's like, oh, I don't really want that, but. Uh. Um, and yeah, Bar- Barbie, Bob, despite um, senior execs at Mattel never really liking it, Barbie was a runaway success. It wasn't until 1964 that Griner and Hauser, which is the German company that produced uh, Lily, mm. found out that um, the Americans had stolen their idea, essentially. Because right. we didn't live in a particularly global society. Mm. And so, you know, as a German, you wouldn't be seeing American advertisements. You wouldn't be seeing American goods, really, in Germany. Um, American goods weren't widely exported in the 1950s. They were mostly making things for domestic markets. Mm. So it wasn't until 64 that they discovered it, realized that they weren't powerful enough to sue Mattel. And so they ended up settling out of court and Mattel bought the rights for Lily for $21,000, which is a fucking pittance, really. Mm. And it effectively killed Lily in Germany. Right. Because Greener and Hauser couldn't even produce Lilies for the domestic market anymore. And so it did, it killed off this kind of cultural killed, icon. Well, it killed the competition, which back then was like, that's a crazy new form of capitalism. And now it's just every day. Bigger companies eating the smaller ones. And it's wild because we in Britain had something called a Cindy doll. Right. We, from, I suppose you didn't have a sister growing up. Um, no, but the name, just even though the name associated with the toy seems oddly familiar for some reason. I yeah. think just in background advertisement and all that stuff. So Cindy was a British version of Barbie, mm. which we had for a very specific reason, which is that in the 1950s and early 1960s, there was an embargo on American goods coming into the UK. Right. Because we still had a wartime economy. And so we were still, we were still rationing in the 1950s. And there was a general concern that if we allowed American goods to be sold over here, the Americans would flood the domestic market with really, really cheap, affordable American consumer products, and British industry would never get its gears running again after the Second World War. What incredible forethought they had back then, as opposed to now, where yeah. we begged and got refused for a trade deal with America because Brexit was basically shitting, us shitting the bed. Um, so yeah, so you weren't allowed, you uh, you just weren't allowed to import American goods into the UK for a bit in the fifties and sixties. Mm. And so we made our own version called Cindy, and she was still popular in the nineties. And my little sister had Cindy dolls instead of Barbie dolls because that's what my mum remembers from the seventies, and I thought that was very cool. For some reason, all I'm thinking is we're going to make our own Barbie doll with <laughs> with crumpets and tea. <laughs> but I think so. That's kind of a bit of a story about how Barbie came to be, and I think it's really interesting that actually she was part of a wider cultural phenomenon that was happening in Germany that got kind of got picked up in America. But something else really big was happening in America at about the same time: the invention of the teenager. Mm. I don't know if you know much about this. I've seen a little bit, I think, in a Wisecrack video. So shout out yeah. Wisecrack for, for uh, it, it, expanding my knowledge on certain very specific things. So essentially, um, the term teenager was first used during, the world, during world War II. Right. But it was, didn't become popular until the mid-1950s. And the concept of the teenager was something that was used. It wasn't really teenagers that were driving it. It was marketing execs. Because yeah, before then, you literally went child to adult. Yeah. And that was because as soon as you weren't a child, you were working and yeah. paying your own way. Whereas in the 1950s, we have the invention of the teenager. And really, it was because young people in America who were in school also had time to work. And so they had a mass of disposable income that American companies fucking wanted. And so they started making products to market specifically to that age range. And Barbie was advertised as being a teenager. Hmm. How genius is that? And so when they created Barbie, she wasn't a grown up. She was a teenager. Mm. And so it gave her this instant like appeal to young children. Being like nothing else that came before. Yeah. She was this cool person who um, Mattel had a Mattel specifically got fashion designers in to design her outfits. She originally appeared in a one-piece bathing suit, and then the other outfits were optional. Um, But originally, she had a big forehead, and weirdly, she had a sideways glance until like the late 60s. 
Yeah. Until In- they started painting her eyes on forwards. Interesting sidebar with the original yeah. comic. There was a constant appeal for uh, readers to send in their uh, fashion designs for Barbie mm. that they would put her in in the next issues. So just aside, I thought that was incredibly clever little like like beginnings of like reader inter- uh, interaction. Because yeah. nowadays, every comic book has a right to the yeah. write in and we'll read your, out your letter or respond to an answer. But back then it was, hey, you could uh, be a little design fashion designer yourself. Well, the, and this is one of the things that was so interesting about Barbie is that it was probably the first toy that was created to really tap into this teenage market. And Barbie was so intrinsically linked to the fashion of the day. And so actually, one of the things that happened is that Barbie's proportions have changed a lot over the years. And one of the driving forces was that was calls by feminists, like, Mm. you know, people who care about young women and their body images um, for Barbie to be more representative of actual body shapes. But a big part of it was for her to fit the fashion of the day. Right. So when the 70s came and it was like flares and different outfits, they reproportioned her so that she would look good in the fashion of the day. In the same way that our ideal body type had changes, you know, 1920s, flapper girls, flat chests, straight frames, going to something more curvy as an Hmm. ideal body type for women. As that evolution was happening in fashion, as was Barbie changing. And so Barbie has always been at kind of the cutting edge of what looks cool and that was something that mattel did very knowingly and it's helped barbie sort of transcend just being a toy and i think you know being a bit of a barbie doll is a derogatory term that's used for women now sometimes isn't it yeah and i bet definitely based on like how it was from the area you're currently discussing Mm. um i think the running theme that i'm noticing seems to be at least from the offsets they always wanted to make Barbie what they thought their target audience aspired to be like. Absolutely. So whether, whether it was a cool teenager, a fashionable adult, or in the 90s, a very successful, loved by all, does is great at everything. I don't know if, if you saw or not in the rest of the comics, she basically has every job. She is yeah. an actress and a... A professional dancer, ice skater, um, got like, what was it a tennis star? Like yeah. every aspirational job, Barbie's doing them all. So yeah. I think that was the running theme was you, we are selling you the dream of who to be like. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, and that's that's what I that's kind of you know. I mean, that's Mad Men one hundred and one. Was Fucking we're not selling hell. you a product, we're selling you a dream. Yeah, like that was that absolutely. Um. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Bar- Barbie was an advertiser's dream because because the concept was so malleable. Um, I and, think and not even necessarily set, following the trends, they probably got to a point of setting the trends, especially for children rather than teenagers. In some degree, yeah, I think Barbie was really important at proliferating modern fashion trends down to younger, younger people. Mm. Um, and again, you wouldn't dress children fashionably until about the nineties. Like you just didn't dress children in the latest fashion. You stuck them in whatever you could afford to put them in. I mean, I still don't dress fashionably, so <laughs> I, I never caught onto that. Um, there's one more fun little tidbit. Mm-hmm. Ruth, who we talked about earlier, she got fired from Mattel um for tax fraud, <laughs> and it would have been about this time. It was late eighties, early nineties that she was struck off from the Barbie team. Um, because she wasn't doing things right. And I just find that so interesting. I mean, the successful ones, then it's never enough for them, is Absolutely. it? Not only have they got to like redefine the toy genre and the entire market industry, but they think, yeah. I need a bit more of my money. I want to keep more of my money. And then they commit tax fraud. But no, I think, because I, I went into this with a real preconception that, I wasn't going to find much of interest here. And I think what I've actually found is a really, through Barbie, a really interesting debate that's happening about women. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, a really Barbie has been at the forefront of both, as you said earlier, pro and con of about portraying what people believe to be idealistic versions of women or yeah. aspirational, like I said earlier. And do you know what? I was I was expecting myself to have a really unnuanced opinion about it. 
But I think what's been fascinating whilst learning about Barbie is that actually we're having a conversation about body image and unrealistic body images alongside a conversation conversation about women being allowed to have aspirations outside the home. Mm. And I kind of think to some degree, I'm like, well, does it matter that Barbie has an idealized body image because she also has an idealized relationship with work and success and everything else? And then I kind of think, well, is our chief priority as people just to succeed and do good work? Or is there something else that we should be striving for? And then I kind of think about human happiness and then I get really miserable. But it's it's been really, but learning about Barbie and thinking about Barbie has been really thought provoking for me. Yeah, I think more but- so than reading fucking Spider-Man. I mean, Spider- <laughs> Spider-Man. Spider Man has his own issues of uh, body image and stuff. I mean, he he looks absolutely ripped in some of those over the top level of rippedness in some of those cartoons and uh, and drawings. I think with Barbie, it's interesting that they've they basically, as you said earlier, they've been reactive to a lot of complaints. So I think by the nineties, like as the of the resident comic Barbie comic expert of the two of us, yeah, the common theme was a lot of stuff was look how great Barbie is, yeah. But in a modest way, in a you could be like her as well, or here's how you could be like She's her. She's skilled but humble. Exactly. Um, but she was beautiful because uh she was tall, blonde, and beautiful. And I think that wasn't necessarily I think some people look at it as a bit more of a sinister like conditioning or something like yeah. that. I think ultimately what it is, it's the same reason that most actors uh, are attractive. It's everyone thinks that the idealized versions of people the people on the big screen, the people in the comics, mm. people everywhere, they're all, uh, if they're on the positive side or a protagonist or whatever, then they're attractive. I mean, hell, even bad people in like TV and films, they're, they're all attractive actors. And it's so interesting because you, so, you look at people in TV and film and even the ugly characters, mm. Tyrion Lannister. Yeah, yeah. Tyrion Lannister, the whole time everybody's talking about how ugly Tyrion Lannister is. And then you actually look at Peter Dinklage, and I'm like, Peter Dinklage is an impossibly handsome man. Mm. The first instance I realized of that dif- of that difference was uh, in The Simpsons, coming back to it, yeah. Simpsons cartoon, the one where Mo gets plastic surgery. Yeah. He then is attractive, and then he gets cast in a TV show, like a soap yeah. uh, opera. And then he gets too big for his boots. The natural, like he, he becomes yeah. an asshole because he's attractive and ditches old friends. And then a wall falls on his face. And it's like, he's horribly disfigured. And it's just back to normal. Back to Moses Luck. <laughs> um, and the, the, there was a line from the, like, a, the TV executive who was producing the TV mm. show. They, he's like, hey, it's still me. And I can still do the, the role or whatever. And she was like, yeah, but now you're not just TV ugly. You're ugly ugly. Yeah. And that always stuck with me. I was like, oh, yeah, there is like a different scale for yeah. ugliness in TV and film. Um, prime example, I think, is like... Peter Parker was meant to be like a bullied nerd, and he's always been portrayed by like the most attractive people: Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, Tom Holland. Exactly, all impossibly handsome. Yeah, quite chiselled men, really. Yeah, and I mean, Tom Holland's an interesting one because he looks very young. He was a very good Spider-Man. I mean, anyone who portrays anyone young is is short. Like, you yeah, look at Daniel Radcliffe. Like, yeah, they're always short because they need them to. Be, look younger when they get older yeah, in the franchise yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff. So you pick a short bloke. Mm. But also the prime example as well is the the trope of the ugly girl who takes the glasses off and lets the hair down. It's like, oh shit, you're fucking hot. Like, who would have thought? Like, well, it's like Velma being played by Linda Cardinelli. Yep. Although, uh, was, was she ever portrayed as ugly? I mean, she was definitely considered less attractive than Daphne. Like, that yeah. was definitely a portrayal. But yeah, I, I see your point. And, and then Linda they did Cardinelli that. was and remains and you, smoking hot. And you still haven't seen the second Scooby Doo film, have you? No. They do that exact thing. They make her hot. Oh. Like they make the Velma character hot. So. Oh, I can't watch it. I mean, it's definitely there's definitely probably some Rule Thirty Four out there of. Uh, I'll I'll send you a link. I'll send you a link. <laughs> but um, sorry, Linda, <laughs> if you're listening. But, um, but yeah, it's. The attractiveness, I think we are still, even though like it's this has been an issue for the entire time that Barbie, though we've known Barbie, like in our lifetimes, it's the idea of attractiveness and like disproportionate representation of like normal looking people 
is still a thing. Well, it's super interesting because if we go back to Lily, um, I don't know how much you know about 19, but I don't know how much you know about Weimar Berlin. I mean, as much as you've told me, I'd say. So Weimar Berlin was this really um, liberal place where there were drag acts and there were gay clubs and it was really permissible. Um, he was accepted to be gay hmm. in 1920s Berlin in a way that it would not have been in America or Britain. Right. Um, and there was kind of a bit of a resurgence of that thinking in post-war Germany. As Germany was rebuilding, I think they kind of reclaimed some of their earlier attitudes towards this stuff. And so, right. pardon me. And so Lily was being put into a society where being rep- like representations like that weren't seen as vulgar in mm. the way that they are they would have been in America or even here or now you mean as in a representation of everyone being attractive do you mean or? well the a representation of lily being attractive and knowing she was attractive right and so lily was the lily doll was kind of even more disproportionate mm. than barbie and the lily doll was kind of meant to be a cartoon the lily doll is proportioned more similarly t- to um Jessica Rabbit than Barbie. Right. Who is like an overshot of male yeah. desire and gaze. And so Barbie really was a honing a honing or a kind of a cutting back almost on the Lily doll. It was you know, she's definitely Barbie's definitely proportioned a little bit more reasonably than Lily was. And there weren't complaints in nineteen fifties Germany about Lily. Mm. She was widely regarded as being really aspirational. But then back then there was no conversation in that because I think we were we were still in a in a much more male dominated society. So And this is maybe true, yeah. But I don't know, it's weird. Our our, our relationship with sex as a society kind of ebbs and flows, doesn't it? Mm. We become you know, we become more liberal and more certain things can become more permissible and then we all get a bit more conservative again and it kind of ebbs and flows and moves, doesn't it? And and that's not to say that I agree with hypersexualized representations of women, but nor do I necessarily disagree with that stuff. I don't I th- know. I think there's a difference nowadays between sexualization and just generally um, over the top or unattainable um, beauty, beauty standards. Beauty standards, yeah. Sexualization, I mean, that can be done to any body type if you think about it. Fucking A. <laughs> sexualization, I think, is more about, as I said, like the desires of the person viewing. Yeah. Whereas I think uh, body standards, that it's across the aisle male and female issue. Yes. Especially these days with going back to the superhero films like Thor, Chris Hemsworth, and chris pine chris evans all the chrises are the, are to be responsible are to be blamed for the male problem. yeah and there's there's a certain element of like the ideal body type for men now being somebody who's doping yeah let's be frank yeah 100 percent. um there's no rules there's no standards or agency for actors doping like, yeah they're all doing it yeah of course yeah yeah no they're all fucking full of that shit aren't they yeah um but and so, so yeah no i mean it's damaging to everyone but we've gone from that just being like a a, a female centered or um female led problem of unattainable body standards and instead yeah. of solving that problem when it was more focused <laughs> on them it's just spilled out into men now so <laughs> we all, all fucked now we all just have unattainable beauty standards that we're killing ourselves trying we're to all meet equally fucked baby exactly so <laughs> So I think that's why we still the Barbie is still very attractive. They they've obviously lent more into diversity in across all different ways, which has mm. been great. But I think because of, as I said, because the way that men now fall under the same beauty standards problem, Barbie in and Ken by association is always going to be very attractive. And that's why they're being played by Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling, who are arguably two of the most attractive people on planet Earth right now. Yeah, I think what's interesting about Barbie and Ken is that they're both incredibly attractive in all of their guises. But at least Barbie's not stupid. Ken is. Yeah. And that's yep. the thing. And, and, and I think that's the, that's the one thing that really charms me about the Barbie universe now that I've spent a bit of time with it, mm. is that we've, we have one area... Where we are represent, where we are presented with a really highly accomplished, incredibly successful woman supporting a blithering idiot of a man, and it's but not even supporting him, just kind of having him around when she wants him, yeah, 
And I think that's so... And he's just happy to be there. Yeah, and he's just happy to be in her fucking orbit. Mm. And that, I think, on some level, I think that sends a really positive it, message. It's also, it's it's one of the rare things to have that dynamic. It's rare for something to have a token male character who is also a bit of an idiot. But it's it's also, I think, really special because he's not around because she's attractive, because he's also attractive. Yeah. And so if that's all he wanted... It's because she's accomplished, I, and I think it. I think it, in some level, teaches you know. And again, I don't know that Barbie's necessarily even all girls anymore. Hmm. Like I don't. I don't think this idea of like girls' toys and boys' toys should have existed, but it did hmm. when the comic that we were talking about was out. It did, but I think that actually, it's almost kind of more important that boys play with Barbies and boys see Barbies. Yeah. And boys look at this doll of this highly accomplished woman and think, yeah, that's normal. And uh, creating standards of this is the kind of woman that you would want. If, as, if you're a straight male, then this is the kind of woman you would grow up like idolizing and even like being attracted to as well. Like well, giving more credence that, to the independent. The... To, well, giving more credence to like not having a woman um, without having the goals of like being a breadwinner and having a woman rely on you like the modern way of like everyone's in it trying to build up themselves and you find someone of equal footing to make a partnership don't know that it's necessarily about who boys want to be in relationships with i think it's about this feeling of equality and so it's not necessarily i want to be with a woman who's like barbie it's women are accomplished and that's normal Hmm. because we are still at a phase i think where men are struggle with and are challenged by accomplished women yeah for sure and so actually just giving little boys a representation of a bunch of women who are accomplished in a bunch of different ways and with the interabled barbies accomplished despite disability Mm. actually i think that's really important for little boys to be playing with those toys and to see those toys and to have them in their orbit and be like this is a woman who's a vet and this is a woman who's a pilot and it's totally like not damaging to my sense of masculinity that Mm. women are doing either of these things right and to be fair, the 90s comic, it was a very specific type of accomplished job that Barbie would have. Yeah. At no point was she a surgeon or a doctor or a, a rocket scientist or anything like that. She was, there were very specific niches. Yeah. But I think they've probably come a bit of a way where now you can probably, I'm assuming, you correct me on this if I'm wrong, but there's probably Barbie doing those jobs that you can get as well now. Well, you could buy Surgeon Barbie in the 1970s and you could okay. buy Astronaut Barbie in the 1960s. Okay, so they, they so were already doing that. Barbie dolls, yeah, no, they've had Barbie dolls that have these highly accomplished careers that require like doctoral degrees. Mm. Since Some the reason 60s. the comic was a bit behind in that regard. I mean, in the five issues. Yeah, that wasn't I read, it just? Like, so who and knows that's why interesting. That and I suppose that might be because they were outside of the core line. But maybe, no, maybe I've they just... were like, no, no one except the target audience are looking at the comics, so we could just do whatever. Yeah, but I honestly think like my time thinking about Barbie has been really profitable to me. Mm. Um, and so I'm definitely going to go see the film. Yeah, we should. We'll make a day of it. I, I... we'll go see Oppenheimer and Barbie in the uh, one go. You can watch Oppenheimer. We'll go. Well, don't you want to see Oppenheimer as well? They, they used a real nuke. Yeah, it you want to see look, a real nuke in a film? It does look kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Should we do a double? I say we'll do a double bill. Yeah, okay. it will. F- we'll flip a coin on which we see first. Should I guide us out? Uh, one thing I was gonna. The last point I was gonna make. Is uh, it interesting? It's it's in the way that you were saying how good is the Barbies doing all this stuff, like the diversity and the you know leading the way. Yeah. I think the best thing that we can hope for is that that's continued success for them because the main thing we know from capitalism is if someone does something successful everyone else will do it. Yeah. So hopefully, I think we're kind of hopeful for Barbie going forward is that they are the the trendsetter for other, you know, children's toys and stuff to yeah. do the same. But honestly, like, as I said up top, um, I had a good look at the Barbie line a few months ago and was really impressed by it. Mm. Thought it was really cool. Like, really liked what I saw. And I'll say that my final thought is on the comic specifically. Yeah. If you can find one of the pun heavy stories, they're worth a chuckle. Also, just have a look for the adverts. Mm. Like the adverts, it was classic Nintendo advertising from the nineties. It was great. Yeah, it was back in the day. Where it was like a kid playing a Game Boy. It's like whoa, and his head explodes. Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, I need that. <laughs>
Right, so thank you for listening. Mm. It's been a really fun episode to record. Probably not a very fun episode to listen to. Nah, I think we've been interesting at the very least. And, yeah. and you know what? It's going to say Barbie in the title. So if you came in here and they thought, if you came in and thought, well, they spoke about Barbie a bit much, Barbie was in the title. I did. Yeah. I did. I probably almost certainly have not done the Oppenheimer joke at time of recording. <laughs> we'll see when it comes to uploading, but I'm almost certain I'm not doing it. So thank you for listening. If you'd like to send us an email, you can do at comicglitter at gmail.com. If you'd like to review us, please do. Just Unless you're up. a disgruntled Oppenheimer fan. No, or even you. Fan. Just as long as it's a five-star negative review, I'm cool yeah. with it. Um, thank you for listening and good night. Good night and goodbye.